Companhia Brasileira de Metalurgia e Mineração, CBMM, is the largest supplier of niobium products in the world. The company supplies approximately 80% of all ferro-niobium used by the global steel industry. The company developed all the processes and all the technology necessary to transform its niobium ore into the finished niobium products used in the marketplace. Steel industry represents approximately 90% of all niobium needs. When the company was formed some 60 years ago, in 1955, the market was in existence. There was no market as we know it today. As a matter of fact, 50 years ago, uh, Niobium was uh, actually just a laboratory dream. Uh, as a young uh, metallurgist student, I realized the importance of niobium in manipulating the properties of carbon manganese, low alloy, and even stainless steels. But it, uh, it took me a long time to really understand it was not until uh, later that I could understand uh, the importance of niobium into the development of uh, those steels that we know today as uh, high-strength, low-alloy steels. When one reads all the key technical publications, most of which were written many decades ago, one will realize that there is a common thread to, to them. This key link among them is the city of Sheffield in England, which is now understood by all as the undisputed origin for the foundation of the knowledge that ended up in the development of high-strength, low-alloy steels containing niobium. Much of the pioneering research dates from the early 1960s and 70s and they were performed in three different Sheffield locations. Swindon Laboratories, Sheffield University, and BISRA, the British Iron and Steel Research Association. Quite fortunately, some of the original researchers are still active today, and through one of them, uh, Dr. Malcolm Gray, I was informed that uh, most of the pioneers are still alive and still interested in discussing and uh, explaining how uh, their early work have shaped the steel processing across the globe. Realizing that we were in front of a very important opportunity, we decided to talk to these important scientists and uh, record their own recounting of the experiences they had in developing this niobium technology to live for future generations. Uh, this, uh, in our vision, would uh, uh, help young metallurgists and help to educate them and to inspire them in their future work. So we would uh, uh, ensure to have a future that would be as productive as our past. I'm pleased to report that the opportunity has been seized on. The project is now complete and uh, the results surpassed our expectations. In the following seven interviews, you will hear from the leading experts in science and applications of niobium, and they, they will explain how their early breakthroughs led us to where we are today in the niobium high-strength steel technology. CBMM owes all these individuals an immense gratitude because without their inspiration, dedication and foresight, the company could not have grown to penetrate the world's markets so successfully as it has done today. We sincerely hope that you find this material as interesting and inspiring as I do.
Well, my name is Bill Morrison, and I got involved in some research here at Sheffield University, which defined the mechanism whereby niobium influenced steel properties. Towards the end of 1958, the Great Lakes Steel Corporation of the USA, a subsidiary of National Steel, entered the marketplace with um, hot roll plates up to a thickness of about 13 millimetres. These were produced in a hot strip mill. And it was amazing because this is a microalloy edition of, of niobium, and of the order of 0.01% niobium gave a 25% increase in steel strength. So it created a sensation worldwide. At that time in the 1950s, niobium was used as an addition to fairly exotic stainless steels, particularly creep-resistant stainless steels. It was also used as an addition to um, super alloys, which were used, for, for example, for gas turbines. But it was not used as an addition to ordinary carbon steels. Um, but there were patents that came out at that time, uh, USA patents granted to Beckett and Franks, where they suggested that uh, additions of niobium as low as 0 0.02, up to 1%, could, could give a benefit to the properties of both carbon manganese and alloy steels. But these were actually never made at that time. So the, the alloy additions of niobium were actually true alloy additions from 0.25 to about 4%. It would have been far too expensive at normal alloy levels. And I, I mentioned before 0.25 to 4%, far too expensive for that, yes. Um, at that time, the um, niobium ore was produced by the African countries, in particularly Nigeria and Belgian Congo. And the supply and demand were roughly in balance. Although the price of niobium in the 1940s was fairly attractive and could have been an addition, could have made an addition to, micro addition to uh, carmine steels, it never was. Uh, but by 1950s, the USA started to stockpile uh, niobium ores because they considered niobium to be an exotic alloy, for example, its use in gas turbines. And therefore, they captured about 90% of the world market in the mid-1950s. So prices spiked in 1955, but then reduced again later on in the 1950s to become more at a more normal level. As I mentioned, the, the major ore fields, niobium ore fields, were in, in Africa, in Nigeria and Belgian Congo. But actually, um, when they obtained independence, these countries, in 1960, political turmoil meant that uh, the niobium mining was interrupted uh, in, the, say, the mid-60s. Fortuitously, major finds of niobium ore were discovered in both Brazil and in Canada. And in particular, Arisha in Brazil, there was a very rich, very large ore field discovered. So that meant that um, there was an unlimited, really an unlimited source of niobium was available from then on. Um, Molycorp, Molybdenum Corporation of, of America, took an interest, a 25% interest in the mine at Arisha. And they asked the question, what can we do with, with this niobium? Bill Wilson of Molycorp then persuaded U.S. Steel to make a trial cast where they added a small addition of niobium to a carbon steel to roll to plates. Bill Wilson probably got his idea of adding this very small addition from the American patents which existed in 1939-1941 um, by Beckett and Franks where they suggested that a niobium addition as low as 0 0.02 might make a difference. So but Bill Wilson had to be congratulated on actually making this micro addition. It wouldn't have been feasible to make a very large addition. It wouldn't have been economic to do that anyway. Unfortunately, the trial in uh, US Steel was, was not successful because although the strength was increased in the hot roll plates, the fracture properties were really rather poor. So that was a failure. However, NF Tisdale of Molycorp then persuaded the Great Lakes Steel Corporation also to do a trial. And they added um, levels of 0.01 to 0.04% to a steel which they then hot rolled in a strip mill. And they found that the properties up to a thickness of 13 millimetres were excellent. They were strong and were also tough. Above that thickness, the properties, again, the fracture properties were poor. So they entered the market, actually, at that level of 13 millimetres hot rolled strip mill plate. There were several other companies in the USA, other steel companies, who started to make steel using the hot strip mill. But also uh, in the UK, my company, Colvos Limited of, of Motherwell, Scotland, started to make um, uh, plates, hot roll plate steels. 
and uh, they found that the small niobium addition, although giving higher strength, unfortunately caused a reduction in the fracture toughness. Exactly the same experience as US Steel had with their, with their trial cast. Well, Colvos were interested in entering the market to supply hot rolled plate steels for, the, um, for the, um, the structural steel market. And they then decided they needed further knowledge uh, of the influence of niobium on, on the properties of steel because of the, the poor effect on fracture properties. Therefore, I was sent to Sheffield University to be supervised by Jack Woodhead in a study of the effect of niobium on, on the properties of carbon-manganese steel. We used production samples from combos in the study. At that time, uh, nobody really knew the, the what the mechanism was for niobium effect. There were various suggestions. Uh, the, the most popular one was niobium caused grain refinement. And this was uh, the, the explanation given by Great Lakes. Obviously, that couldn't be totally true because if that were true, both the strength and the fracture toughness would be improved. So that wasn't a good reason. Beiser, uh, who from the Union Carbide, also had some research done in 1959 in which he suggested that although niobium caused grain refinement, it also formed a brittle grain boundary carbide, which caused uh, poor fracture toughness problems. There was other explanations floated around about that time. One was solid solution hardening by niobium, and one was uh, niobium and carbon formed molecules, but none of these explanations um, told the whole story, and none of them explained satisfactorily the structure and properties of niobium treated steel. The credit must go to Jack Woodhead for utilising for the first time structure property relationships to study the effect of niobium, it was to highlight the effect of niobium. And these were based on the patch equations which related grain size to both strength and to fracture toughness. And this was the first time that these equations had been, had been used in this way. It was found that the niobium effect was primarily due to a precipitation hardening effect. By heat treating the steel samples at different temperatures to try to plot linear patch plots, we found that the niobium treated steel did not obey the patch relationship. At coarse grain sizes, there was a very large effect of niobium on the strength, but at fine grain sizes, there was literally no effect at all. This was explained by ourselves that Niobium had gone into solution at the high temperatures required to form the coarse grain sizes and had re-precipitated as a very fine precipitate, giving precipitation hardening. At lower temperatures, where we were obtaining fine grain sizes, around the 900 for example, the precipitation hardening was much reduced, grain size was refined and fracture toughness was improved. After the completion of the thesis in June of 1960, um, and this work wasn't published in 1963, but the results were well known, I returned to Colvos to continue my research. And in Colvos, I discovered two more effects of niobium. Well, I, I, uh, by using electron microscopy, we were able to actually see these very fine precipitates, which we were unable to do in Sheffield University. These were advanced electron microscope techniques at that time. And the, the formation of the particles was generally in the form of rows, very fine rows of, of, of precipitate. Um, I also discovered the effect of niobium on the transformation uh, between um, austenite to ferrite. It reduced the transformation temperature sufficiently, in many cases, to cause um, bainite formation when the niobium was in solution. It was because of the research both at Sheffield and in Covell's research labs had sufficient knowledge and experience to go ahead with the full-scale production into the marketplace with hot rolled and also heat treated steel plates for the structural steel market. Other um, companies in the UK followed suit and there were sufficient results obtained that by 1962 it was possible to introduce a new British steel standard, BS968 which uh, allowed the addition of niobium, microalloying addition of niobium, um, which allowed an increase in strength over the previous specification, but also a better weldability because it uh, reduced both the carbon and manganese contents. Unfortunately, even though I used hot rolling techniques in convos to vary the grain size, 
uh, and I discovered at that time that all the niobium treated steel samples were much finer grained than the non niobium sam samples. I failed to recognise that niobium influenced the rate of recrystallisation of arsenide. So I missed that. But that, was, uh, that, that fact was discovered here in Sheffield by Jim Marani and his co workers that uh, niobium had a very powerful effect on the rate of recrystallisation of arsenide during hot rolling. This led to the development of control rolling or um, techniques which allowed the production of high strength, tough plate steels used for, mainly used for pipelines uh, which benefited the oil and gas industry. So I've only covered the very early research period and from 1963 onwards there was a huge effort, huge R&D effort throughout the world and that was because of this amazing effect of a small amount of niobium on properties. So every major steel company in the world had their own R&D program. And from that time onwards, there's a huge amount of research was published and many new microalloy steels were produced. I started postgraduate research in 1945 uh, and I regarded myself at that time as a metallographer. This was mainly because this fitted in with the limited resources of a university department at that time, because all you needed was an optical microscope. In 1948, as a lecturer, I developed uh, a, a lecture programme on relationship between structure and properties of metals. This was reasonably simple in relation to metals like copper and, and aluminium, but was much more difficult in relation to steel. And particularly frustrating uh, were the tempered martensitic structures, which at that time went under the names like trustite and sorbite, but that just could not be resolved by the optical microscope. In 1952, I was invited to the opening of the new laboratories of United Steel Companies, uh, named Swindon Laboratories, um, I was vastly impressed with the facilities at this laboratory, particularly the support facilities of steel making, rolling, analysis, uh, all the things that had been difficult at university, and which, which encouraged me then to the idea of um, research on, on, on a major scale. In 1954, I was uh, delighted to be offered the job of head of metallurgy department at Swindon Laboratories. And what excited me most was the prospect of being able to use these support facilities for much broader and systematic uh, investigations of, of steel structures. The um, intention then was to carry out these studies on all of the steels uh, produced by um, United Steel, which was wide-ranging all the way from structural steels through uh, alloy steels, stainless steels, creep-resisting steels, etc. Uh, and to head this department, I appointed uh, Brian Pickering. Although we started these studies in 1954, uh, the immediate priority was not on ferrite perlite steels, partly because of the commercial uh, priorities of, of, on prior uh, commercial demands for the other types of steel. We started on low carbon bainitic steels, which had been recently developed by United Steel and which were in commercial production, uh, but really the metallurgical background to them was little understood. We then moved through that to uh, stainless steels and to creep resisting steels because there were big demands from these user industries which were making their own developments very rapidly at that time, large power plants, nuclear plants, and, and the like. And compared to this, the demand for structural steels was, was really quite limited. There were extensive studies on uh, austenitic steels, stainless steels, creep-resisting steels, um, and of course, niobium, was a feature of, of many of these steels, but at the higher levels that, that you would associate with a conventional alloying element, up to say 
1957, we began to uh, devote our attention to structural steels, to uh, low alloy uh, structural steels. The main reason was that the user industries were beginning to change their demands. Weldability was becoming a factor, uh, introducing uh, heat affected zone cracking, attention therefore on chemical composition, particularly carbon content. Uh, designers, engineering designers, were beginning to specify yield strength uh, as opposed to tensile strength, which had been the main design criterion prior to that. We set out to uh, study the various factors controlling the properties of ferrite polite steels, uh, and it was clear early on that grain size was important, was an important factor, and also that precipitation hardening uh, could introduce added strength. At the same time, we were keeping check on commercial developments around the world. Uh, we learned of work at Mannesman on aluminium, vanadium, nitrogen steels, which were fine grain. And we also had information from Great Lakes Steel with improved X50 and X55 steels uh, using niobium. This was quite a new concept to us because previously we'd concentrated mainly on the aluminium, aluminium nitrogen fine grain steels. Uh, and so we're particularly interested in, in this sort of new element to our work. It used to be a fairly simple matter uh, just to define chemical composition and a few mechanical properties, but it was emerging from the work that we've been talking about on niobium steels that uh, factors like reheating temperature, uh, rolling temperature, uh, finishing temperature, these were all important and so there's much more work to be done there but probably outside the scale of laboratory work. So a lot of the work then moved into steelworks uh, to develop the uh, rolling, the, the total rolling procedure. There was another major change which was beginning to affect the definition of these steels, and that is that welding had become so important and heat affected zone cracking was a problem. A lot of work was done by the Welding Institute, uh, which was leading, first of all, to much lower carbon contents. Now carbon's important, but also other chemical elements are important. So they embodied this into a carbon equivalent value, and so there was specification then for a lower carbon equivalent. In general terms, moving from something like 0.4 uh, down to 0.3. The total effect of all this was a complete change in steel making, because they were now beginning to uh, specify sulfur contents down to 0.001%. A complete change in rolling procedures, uh, and compared to say 25 years previously, this was a complete revolution in the whole of the steel making and manufacturing process. The fractures which mainly contain ferrite perlite structures in carbon manganese steels. Uh, uh, the factors are, in fact, those which can be examined by optical metallography. Uh, uh, we knew there was, in fact, a, some effects of uh, grain size, for example, uh, uh, and uh, perlite content on the uh, yield stress. Uh, no perlite on the yield stress, of course, but. Uh, uh, but perlite uh, appeared on the tensile strength. Uh, and there was always something over, which in fact was uh, associated with precipitation. And we hadn't a clue what the precipitation was uh, in this. 
We knew it was not sometimes not aluminium nitride, although some people thought it was, but we knew it wasn't because we knew some aluminium nitride largely precipitated on the grain boundaries. Uh, uh, and that doesn't cause general strengthening. Uh, it enables you to refine the grain size, and that was why aluminium was so good for grain refined steels, for example. Uh, so this was the uh, start of the thing. Uh, and we looked, uh, I was looking uh, at the effect of perlite and grain size on the structure and properties of yield stress particularly, but also the tensile strength of carbon manganese steels. Uh, grain size is the only strengthening mechanism uh, which in fact can increase uh, both toughness and strength. Uh, by increased toughness I mean to uh, decrease the impact transition temperature uh, in the material. Uh, and uh, uh, this is what grain size was used for. Uh, we were able to examine my grain size uh, uh, because in fact it was easily measurable uh, uh, in the optical microscope. Uh, uh, and uh, say it was only when we wanted to begin to quantify the precipitation effects, which were not only niobium carbide, but also other carbides and nitrides, vanadium which were one particularly one, and titanium uh, uh, as well, uh, but also other precipitates uh, in steels uh, that we actually had to use the electron microscope. The first electron microscope was an Elmiscope. I don't wish to forget it was. It was a one, I think, or two, was it? Uh, Elmiscope two. Uh, and it was a 60 kV uh, electron microscope, uh, uh, not very uh, powerful at all. But in fact, it was excellent for extraction replicas, uh, uh, for doing replicas and extraction replicas in particular. And uh, we developed uh, the extraction replica techniques to a fairly high degree. Uh, uh, it was only later, and uh, Bob will remember this uh, himself, uh, that we spent, uh, I think, probably a month, or he spent a month at least, trying to make thin foils of all sorts of materials because it was very difficult to make thin foils uh, uh, to use transmission electron microscopy with them. Uh, but uh, you could get remarkable results using good uh, uh, extraction replicas, for example, uh, uh, quite remarkable results uh, from those. So that's what we, how we used it. The, the microscope was delivered by Siemens uh, 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 to these the laboratories. There afterwards, electron microscopes tried to do everything, uh, from analysis and uh, diffraction and this, that and the other. You hadn't got diffraction, no selected area diffraction on this. Uh, you only had general diffraction uh, on this. And in fact, uh, uh, all you had to do was to look at ring patterns, basically. Uh, 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 and uh, to identify what was there. And in fact, just by looking at the ring pattern, the different types of ring pattern, you could identify whether it was an adium carbide or uh, chromium carbide or whatever it was sort of thing. Uh, so it was uh, an excellent uh, uh, instrument. So you, we, we had three contributions, perlite, grain size, and uh, the uh, uh, precipitation strengthening. But on the other hand, there were about uh, ooh, uh, uh, ooh, six or eight solid solution hardening factors which we identified and were able to quantify because you could take these by making steels which contain just simply silicon additions and uh, manganese additions and chromium additions and nickel additions and so forth and in fact by taking out the basic strength out of that you could say what the solid solution hardening was and of course things like nickel were very little solid solution hardening whereas things like phosphorus were high degrees of solid solution hardening. Early introduction to niobium steels was in 1960 when I joined the Swindon Laboratories, uh, which belonged then to the United Steel Companies. I was already aware of uh, the work on niobium that Bill Morrison was doing with Jack Woodhead, uh, having worked in the same laboratory uh, under Arthur Quarrell. I was very fortunate in having a sound knowledge of statistics uh, which I had acquired uh, during some six or seven years in industry and which was then honed by Jack Woodhead at Sheffield University. Uh, Jack and I shared a, a great interest in statistics and we also shared a great interest in stereology and uh, very much bounced ideas off one another even though he wasn't my supervisor. My early work at Swindon Labs involved uh, 
the study of structure property relationships, particularly in relation to ferrite perlite steels. These constitute quite a significant proportion of the tonnage that is produced in this country, over 90%. Um, so, uh, bearing in mind my interest in statistics and stereology, it was a quite natural background uh, to try and produce some relationship between the microstructure uh, which we quantified and the properties which were also quantified. And using the fairly extensive facilities that there were here uh, in terms of hot rolling, steel making, electron microscopy, optical microscopy, all, all the facilities that you could really wish for, uh, we accumulated uh, quite a lot of data. And uh, bearing in mind also that there was a substantial computing facility in the mathematics department here, uh, it was natural to go for a regression analysis uh, between microstructure and properties. So, armed with uh, about a hundred data sets of uh, structure and properties, um, uh, we commenced the uh, statistical analysis uh, using regression techniques. And there were some very interesting results came out of this. Firstly, uh, if we looked at the effects of grain size particularly, then uh, grain refinement was the only mechanism, really, which improved both the strength and the toughness simultaneously. In all the others, there was some disadvantage to the toughness if you increase the strength. Uh, the second thing that came out of it, as I remember, was the effect of carbon. And carbon was uh, adversely affected the toughness, and at the same time, it didn't contribute anything to the yield strength. So it's quite natural that uh, you would develop low carbon, grain refined steels for structural uh, applications. The other thing that we noticed was that if you took niobium steels in particular, then niobium would have a grain refining effect and would increase the strength. But this only happened in the normalised condition or after very low temperature rolling. If uh, you used high solution temperatures, as you do with hot rolling, uh, then in the as hot rolled condition, the niobium steels were substantially stronger than they would have been uh, according to the grain size and, and other factors. Now this extra strength of niobium uh, was due uh, to precipitation strengthening. And we produced one of the earliest pictures of the now, uh, now termed interphase precipitate. Uh, although we didn't know it was interphase precipitate at the time, uh, and uh, that was in 1963. This analysis also showed important effects of cooling rate um, and uh, uh, other factors on the strength and toughness of niobium steels. We were able to produce charts which showed what was attainable with precipitation strengthening and grain refinement. Uh, and uh, this was quite significantly in excess of that for in commerce mild steel. Um, in fact, the addition of 0.04% of niobium could result in a doubling or even a tripling of the strength. This was uh, very important uh, commercially because none of the other factors could produce those increases in strength at a, an economic cost. We were able to construct vector diagrams uh, showing the effect of uh, grain refinement on the mechanical properties uh, and uh, the simultaneous increase in yield strength and improvement in toughness. Uh, this effect was followed by precipitation strengthening which although strengthening quite substantially, 
only produced mildly adverse effects on, on the toughness. One of the uh, important things that uh, was found out was uh, really taken up by another laboratory in this area, that is at uh, Bizra by Jimmy Rani. Uh, we knew that you could control the grain size by uh, the rolling uh, uh, practices, uh, such as the heating temperature, uh, the finishing temperature, and so on. But this was really developed by uh, Jim Rani at Sheffield, and they were able to produce really significant grain refinement by using very low uh, um, rolling temperatures. In determining the mechanism of this grain refinement during controlled rolling, uh, two factors were considered. One is that the austenite grains could be elongated to very uh, high length to width ratios, 30 to 40 to 1. And this produced a very fine austenite grain size in the lateral dimension, which in turn transformed to give a very fine ferrite grain size. And the part of this uh, effect really came from an effect of niobium carbide being strain induced in, uh, in the austenite range and the strain induced particles inhibiting recrystallization of the austenite to give these elongated grains. The extent of this effect uh, was to retard recrystallization by a factor of about a thousand times at temperatures in the region of 850 degrees centigrade. The regression analysis work that I've talked about was uh, relied extensively on work that had previously been carried out by Hall and Petsch uh, to show the effect of grain size on yield strength and by Ashby and Oravan who had shown the effects of precipitate particles on yield strength. These formats were used in the regression work uh, and proved very successful in predicting the results, uh, the mechanical properties particularly, uh, yield strength and toughness. So if we look at niobium, uh, we see that uh, there are two important effects. One is its grain refinement effect, and second comes from the precipitation of niobium carbide after high temperature treatment usually during transformation to give the interface precipitate. So in addition to grain refinement, you also have precipitation strengthening. So there are three important effects of, uh, of niobium. One is uh, if you're going to heat up, the fine niobium carbide particles can produce uh, grain refinement. Secondly, if you heat to high temperatures in the austenite range, uh, you can get precipitation hardening by niobium carbide formation, usually on transformation. And the third effect of niobium is in fact in retarding the recrystallization of austenite uh, and thereby giving these very elong elongated austenite grains which are very small in the lateral dimension and give rise to a very fine ferrite grain size. We were able to create the scientific background and the, the full structural property relationships for all these steels and I think that over the years, 15 years from 1955 to 1970, I think we did just that and that is we really put together a, a full story which, which, which could really be a chapter in a, in a textbook. Um, it also demonstrated to me that uh, you needed to support these uh, physical metallurgy techniques with a whole range of support facilities uh, steel making, rolling, heat treatment, etc. Uh, 
when Bain published his work on isothermal transformation, he said it was merely the result of 10,000 heat treatments. If I think back to the work that we've been describing, I can't imagine the number of steel making casts, heat treatments, etc. It was really a vast amount of work that was condensed into a series of, we think, sort of classic papers on, on the physical metallurgy of steel. Um, the result has been a major advance in structural steels, uh, and I think it's extremely encouraging to see the way that uh, Niobe in, in microalloyed steels, which was just one alternative a number of years ago, has really emerged to be the, the main and the important uh, element in, in the whole field of high structural, high strength structural steels. The thing that I thought was the best thing that happened here was that uh, we were given a free range to think as we wanted to think and to do the work we wanted to do. And uh, you, that's the finest way of making progress. It's when you find you're constrained within a certain framework to do the work that you don't make progress. Uh, and I think that, that we were given that freedom here. Well, I was given that freedom here. And uh, that was a tremendous advantage. In these steels, these ferrite perlite steels, it wasn't absolutely necessary except to want, when you wanted to look at the actual structure of the interface precipitation. Uh, it, uh, you could then uh, uh, get these lines of precipitates and you could actually stop them on, grip, on boundaries, interface boundaries, etc., and uh, look at them. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it wasn't uh, uh, so important. Uh, uh, most of the structure property relationship work that was published uh, in up to 19 what would be 60 something uh, uh, was uh, uh, just done by optical metallography, crane size, perlite content, uh, uh, basically. Uh, uh, when we wanted to, in fact, break down the uh, uh, other increments of strengthening uh, uh, to uh, into dividing between solid solution only and precipitation only and so forth, then in fact we had to use uh, other techniques. An important contribution here was the rationalisation of the structure property relationships so that it became possible given the steel composition uh, to actually predict what the properties would be uh, before you ever determined them. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, Hall Petch and uh, Ashby Oregon. Well, these are quantitative relationships and uh, were invaluable really in sorting out the various contributions of niobium. I mean, I was, I was directed to look at structure property relationships, but that was the limitation, if you like. Otherwise, I was free to do what I wanted to do. And uh, the statistical work and the structural work was all made possible by the facilities that were here uh, at Swinland Laboratories and which Ken and Brian had so kindly set up for me, really. It was a joy to, uh, to work here. We had the policy from day one, really, that we were going to publish the results of what we did. Uh, and the reason for that is that not only is it um, satisfying for the individuals, because research workers like to feel that they're getting some sort of recognition publicly for the work that they're doing, but beyond that, the company gets recognition. The company gets uh, recognition of the fact that it knows about steel. And in many cases, we were approached by companies that we weren't even selling steel to, to answer some of their problems, just on the basis that they knew from our publications that we knew um, a lot about the background of steels. The question of interaction then with foreign companies and, and particularly research laboratories um, again was part of the policy which is we like people to know what we're doing but we'd also like to know what they're doing and ultimately there's a, a balanced exchange of information there. Um, the man who was previously my director of research used to have a maxim that we only make 3% of the world steel uh, and probably we're doing 
three, four, or five percent of the world's research. What about the other nine, 95 percent? Why can't we get some benefit from that if they're getting the benefit of our three percent? Good maxim, which we, we attempted to follow throughout, really. Yeah, I, th I think also. But, uh, uh, it's very difficult to be directly constructive about it. The things evolved. There are a lot of people involved. Everybody was interested in niobium steel. It was a hot topic. Uh, but the users of steel were also evolving. And I can remember in the mid-60s, early 60s, was it, when there were, um, everyone was interested in the payload, use of high-strength steel in transport and so on. And, and this is the, the kind of thing that has ultimately led to the adoption, if you like, uh, of high-strength steels, together with the properties that we've mentioned before for steel structures in the uh, North Sea, um, you know, everywhere, as Ken has said. There have been developments in the use of steel, uh, and, uh, and that has led uh, particularly to the high-strength region. Um, which has made niobium so important, I think. Yeah, I, I think that one of the things that I always remember people saying uh, uh, was if you could add uh, uh, 0.01 percent of niobium to every ton of mild steel made, you could sell God knows how many tons of niobium, uh, 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 and that the niobium people should be highly interested in it because that was the thing that we were doing, adding that sort of 0.02 percent of uh, niobium. Or Colombian, as it was then called. Uh, I think in the immediate post war years, there was the prospect of everything developing uh, enormously. You'd come from a, a period when everything had been constrained, uh, and across all industries, there was this concept of expansion and, and development. And I can remember sitting at a desk here with the first Apple computer on my desk and it had a 4K storage. Uh, and if you think now how that industry has developed, my point all the way through was there's no reason why the steel industry can't develop as quickly as the chemical industry, the pharmaceutical industry and, and so on. And I think if you just take this specific example of microalloy steels, there's a good example that we can say, well, we have done our bit. It, it, it has developed in that sort of way. One of the things uh, uh, that, I, that struck me when we were doing this was uh, how the steel industry itself has changed. And, for example, one of the claims for niobium steels was that it could be used in balanced yeah. steels, uh, oh, where you got a 100% of product yield from the... Um, from the ingot, uh, whereas in kill steels, which, which you needed for aluminium treated and, and so on, you, you had 75% of the product of the ingot would finish up in the uh, sales room. Um, so it was a, a good element to have in balanced steels. But of course, continuous casting came along, balanced steels disappeared, all steels were killed, so that advantage for niobium. Uh, sort of disappeared, but the other advantages still remain. Uh, a similar event happened in the connection with the through thickness toughness of, of, of these uh, through thickness ductility, um, where inclusion shape control was all the rage in the 70s and early 80s and ultimately disappeared because sulphur disappeared from the steel, so there's no need to control the sulphide. Uh, so it, it was quite interesting. Some of the work that you do just won't pay off because of the, these changes. But the Niobian did. <laughs>